Hello, and welcome to the Project Good podcast. I'm your host, Anne-Marie Hilton. Project Good is a social impact podcast interviewing experts and advocates about the pressing problems that we face globally and hearing how they suggest we move forward in the future. The Project Good podcast is brought to you by Project Good Work. The goal of this podcast is to inspire people and organizations to develop a mindset that can move others to positive action regarding the complex social issues facing people and the planet. For October, we're focused on the Army of Liars. We live in an age where truth is being re-examined. While humans are naturally inclined to seek out information that confirms their existing beliefs, known as confirmation bias, it is also known that emotional narratives often resonate more with individuals than factual data, making it easier for misleading information to take root. Additionally, distrust in traditional institutions such as the media, government, and scientific organizations has grown. When people feel that these institutions are unreliable, they may, tur- they may turn to alternative sources that align with their views. The rise of social media has made it easier for false information to spread quickly. Political and ideological divisions have created echo chambers where people only engage with information that reinforces their beliefs, often dismissing opposing viewpoints as false. And sadly, we face a society where some groups may deliberately manipulate information for political, economic, or social gain, blurring the lines between fact and opinion. What's a person to believe in anymore? Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Andrew V. Edwards, an author, technologist, and speaker. He is the author of Digital is Destroying Everything, which has been translated into Chinese and Turkish. His second book, Army of Liars, was recently published this year and will be the main topic of discussion. Andrew has also written dozens of articles about digital analytics for ClickZ, the world's largest online source of marketing advice and information. With the rise of social media disinformation threats, Andrew founded Verity7 and works to deliver world-class anti-disinformation training and consulting. Let's get into the interview. Figuring out what information you can trust in today's digital age is often like walking through a field of landmines. Our guest today, Andrew V. Edwards, has many achievements. He is the co-founder and director emeritus at the Digital Analytics Association. Since 2004, the association has been the world's largest organization developed to the study of online customer behavior. In the early 1990s, Andrew founded and ran Renaissance Multimedia, one of the first interactive agencies in New York City. He went on to found Technology Leaders, one of the first consulting companies devoted to digital analytics. His online expertise on consumer behavior and the continuous changing digital landscape gives him an edge in understanding how to navigate that virtual world. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Hi. um, So before we get started in the interview and dive into the questions, I always ask um, a little information about everybody I interviewed to get to know them, their heart, and you know who they are and how they came to be the human that they are. Yep. Um, so you know, uh, everybody, of course, uh, has their their things that they tend to gravitate towards. So, what made you? Um, I guess I would say, and maybe I'm wrong, uh, fall in love with information and data. That's a that's a great question, and um, so I would say that. Uh, it, you know, I took a circuitous path to this place. I actually got started with computing pretty early, having professed to dislike computers. Uh, and then one day somebody showed me a computer that could do graphics. And um, I, I have a background in, in, gra- in graphics and the arts. And so I really began my journey into computing by being a computer illustrator. And I uh, did work for magazines and companies and things like that, which led me to open up the interactive company that you mentioned, Renaissance Multimedia. This was back in the in the mid 1990s. It was actually before there was a web and I was building CD ROMs and things like that for companies. And then I was got the opportunity to build some of the very first websites uh, that were ever made. And after I, um, I ended up um, selling that company and moving on to other things. And then I had the opportunity to found another company with some partners 
this time it was I, I found myself more intrigued by figuring out what people were doing on these websites I was more interested in that than than building the websites and so that's how I got into uh, data analytics or digital analytics as it's called and um, quickly it, it really began to catch on and grow and, and then I founded the digital co-founded the digital analytics association and kept with it for several years after that and um, I, I kind of learned uh, that you can't make decisions without data or at least big companies felt that way and that's why they wanted to have all this data about what people were doing on these very expensive uh, properties that they had developed online and as as you probably know you know things on the web are much more measurable than other media and so this became extraordinarily attractive to a lot of companies and i was kind of in the thick of that okay that reminds me of um i don't know if i'm going to say it right because i usually fumble these little sayings i said i think is it uh form uh, uh form tells function or function tells form i think it's function tells form so it's sort of like i guess uh answering that for companies since you started from, I guess I would say, an artist's uh, perspective. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, so I, I, so it makes sense to me then to jump into information. It's, uh, um, you know, uh, I guess they use that saying a lot when it comes to architecture. And essentially, you know, when it comes to um, digital information, we are essentially building, uh, quote, unquote, virtual worlds and buildings um, so it it uh, it all makes sense, I guess, yeah, uh, why I, I you think, would have yeah, dove into that. I think mm -hmm. the connection is that, you know, I was building these websites, but, you know, in the early days, we couldn't tell whether anybody was even looking at them. And and then we uh, the, the industry started moving towards, well, t things such as Google Analytics, which is a product that's still out there. And essentially, it, it became a matter of why are we doing this? Or do people care? And the measurement started to take place, I would say, right around the year 2000 or a little bit after that. And it turned out that this was enormously informative and it informed how we would make changes to the website going, you know, going forward. So you'd build a site and then you'd measure what, what people were interested in and then you'd be able to make adjustments to that content based on what you found out. Yes. Yep. Uh, yes. Uh, analytics. And I know um, it's become quite the, you know, um, the art and the field and um, with all the different information, um, obviously it's, uh, you know, it fuels the direction for a lot of different things now. And um and and most companies, you know, won't even move without looking at the data anymore. That that's correct. And moreover, it really is the heart and soul of of social media companies, which are the prime vectors for disinformation uh, these days. Um, they would really not have a business if it weren't for analytics, because their entire model um is based on keeping people on their sites for as long as they can keep them there in order to show them more ads and so the only the only way to do that is to know what will keep people on the site longest and that requires data analytics and then it also requires a lot of other infrastructure which we can get into uh, but the basis of it is data collection and analysis Right. And so um, one of the things since we are talking and uh, leading into um, social media, because um, I think when social media started, uh, well, maybe not everything, obviously, because we started out before um, we got to Instagram, we had uh, Facebook. So we were thinking of, I guess, the first word of social media, we we're thinking of socializing, or that's what we thought the goal was. Um, but, um, in, I guess, just understanding, uh, socialization, um, ironically or not ironically that it becomes, um, um, that it's, uh, it really goes into, I guess, psychology, uh, of how people, um, think. And so, um, and, and obviously now we find that, um, uh, for, uh, the people that, um, you know, didn't live in this world, understanding the, the power of uh, social media and the power of 
um, you know, um, the digital world and digital marketing, um, that it was really uh, getting into understanding people. Um, and now people, I guess the 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 masses have woke up, <laughs> woke up um, that it was, uh, you know, the the intent is uh, it goes deeper than uh, pretty pictures and saying hi to grandma. Well, this is true. So since you uh, since you're in this world, I guess uh, let's talk about I guess let's do a warm up before we dive in and start getting into the, the gory parts. I guess what would you say first? We'll, uh, we'll do a, a soft question. What's the the greatest part about social media? <laughs> well, yeah, no, there are some good parts to social media. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you'll probably hear me saying a lot of bad things about it. But nonetheless, um, it does have the potential to do what the their marketing says they do, which is, quote, unquote, bring people together. Uh, you Like one of the things that I um, noticed about it, uh, and I believe it's a positive, is that um, one never needs to lose track of one's old friends anymore. Uh, this was a thing that used to happen. I mean, um, and, and I'm kind of an old movie buff, so I look at, I see these old movies, and, you know, people say goodbye, and they may never figure out where that person ever is again. But with social media, you probably do, and you can stay in touch, <laughs> and that's a wonderful thing. Yes, yes, it is. Um, I was uh, when you were saying that. Uh, yeah, so I was thinking about. Um, uh, you gave me the image of uh, uh, high school reunions. Now sometimes I'm like, ah, no need to go. <laughs> What's right. there to talk about? What, <laughs> What's there to talk about? <laughs> yeah, or at least you can see what they look like and decide if you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, or, or or I know this is bad. Or sometimes you're like, okay. For me, uh, you know, uh, most recently it was a reality check of how old I was getting. So I was like, oh, I really need to make sure that I'm, you know, staying fit, eating the right foods, because some of these people I don't recognize anymore. <laughs> right, 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 right. They, yeah, yes, they yeah. gained a little weight over the years, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, now, I guess if, uh, you know, um, the thing, of course, that everybody is, uh, you know, up in arms about, and I think they should be, um, because it's affecting, you know, um, uh, people globally across the world are the, uh, I guess, the dangers of social media. So let's start diving into, sure. um, I guess, where do, where do we go wrong from this, you know, um, I guess, uh, um, uh, fun uh, yeah. yearbook or, uh, you know, socialization platform into like, oh, my gosh, you know, people are now killing themselves over this. Right. So I believe that social media, unfortunately for all of us, has become weaponized by people that I call cynical manipulators who have, uh, it took them a while to figure out, because uh, I, I regard them as almost members of a criminal class, and it takes uh, a while for criminals to figure out how to uh, abuse systems. They're never leaders, they're camp followers. And so for the longest time, and I was one of these people. I felt like, gee, we no one needs to police anything on the internet. We're kind of self-regulating, and you know, no, we don't need any help from anybody. Um, I believe that that situation has changed as it essentially went from a niche product to mass media, uh, and the and the overall global popularity of social media has dwarfed all other media at this point, and so. Um, they are now enormously powerful organizations with huge influence. So that can't escape notice and and everyone can see it. And so can the cynical manipulators. In other words, uh, people or organizations, some domestic, some foreign, uh, decide that they have messages, many of them based on fabulisms, lies and disinformation they have messages, usually political messages, that they want to get across in order to drive election results. And I think that's kind of where we really kind of got into trouble, where um, the same mechanism that was used to, you know, post pictures of the baby shower or the, the high school reunion became now uh, places where uh, uh, stories that would be completely invented would be made up and promulgated throughout the system, and by the way, targeted 
at specific audiences in a way such that those audience would, audiences would be most receptive to these messages. And this is one of those things about analytics that really drives social media insofar as um, uh, you can, any, anyone can tell, say, a Facebook or uh, an X or a YouTube that they want to buy a particular audience. Uh, which is which means I would like to have my content shown to this particular slice of the of the of your usership, and they, and these can be very very narrow slices of of groups of people that are especially persuadable, and then they uh, target them with very specific messages that are meant to drive political opinions. Yes, and so uh, and you know uh, here in the U.S. Um... We're in a in in this uh, mix of a, a serious election year once again uh, in 2024, and um, I think for a lot of people, um, uh, because the U.S. is in a what should I say? Uh, I, I call it like a, a reckoning point. <laughs> yes. Of uh, of um, of who we want to be as a nation, uh, who we, uh, but it's even deeper than that. I think it's what we represent, um, uh, I guess, even from maybe a moral standpoint. Um, yeah. And also, um, you know, uh, because we had a lot of people, we were kind of like, um, even though we're quote unquote young as a, a country, um, we were looked up to as the, you know, the kind of big brother. Sure. Uh, we had yeah. Yeah, so we had a standing in the world. You're you're right about that, and that's actually one one of the reason one of the reasons why the U.S. is especially uh, targeted by uh, uh, foreign actors um, is because people in other countries care about what goes on in the United States because the United States is far more powerful than almost any other country. And, and everything that happens here has an influence in the world. And there are certain countries that really have issues with the United States. Um, and they are often the ones to be found behind some of this pernicious messaging. Yes. And so one of the things, of course, that always comes up um, because we are in the U.S. and we are the inventor, inventors um, of the most popular social media platforms um, and and we you know uh, led led the way um, with the start of this um, yes. uh, spread of, right. spread of information. Um, we have the thing that always comes up, of course, is yes, everybody screams like, "Oh my goodness, how did we let it get to this point?" But also, there's the the other part is uh, uh, the the one that you probably always encounter is what about freedom of speech? And sure. freedom of you know uh, being able to say your idea or tell people yep. what they what you want to say, and it's up to that person to decide is it for me or not. Right. So yeah, that's a great point. And uh, so um, uh, there's a couple things here. So there's a law called Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act, which essentially is the reason why social media can exist. Um, that um, law gives them. Uh, 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 two two rights, okay, which I believe are are logically incompatible, uh, and and so you will hear me talking about how we need to get rid of Section two thirty, and that's a big lift, but uh, I I firmly believe that it's necessary. Section two thirty does the following: it grants a uh, platform self styled platforms. And it does this for them and no other publisher, okay? Other, normal publishers, book publishers, magazines, newspapers, websites that aren't social media, uh, newscasters not covered by this. Only social media companies are covered by this. They, ha they are granted two rights. You, they are allowed to make decisions about what they want on their platform. They're not forced to put anything on there. So if somebody sends something and it doesn't get on and it doesn't get on, it's because the platform decided they didn't want it there for whatever reason. And by the way, when you sign the user end user agreement with any of these uh, companies, when you sign up for an account, you immediately sign away any right that you might have had. You have no recourse whatsoever. These are private companies. 
The second thing it does, and this is where I really have a problem, they, uh, they are granted, as I said, the right to choose what they want on the site, but um, they also have the, the uh, they are protected from any and all liability, unlike any other publisher, from anything that gets on the, that site. And that includes um, libel, uh, it includes doxing, it includes um, any kind of damages that might uh, come from targeted and even violent uh, disinformation, or not even violent disinformation, but invitations to violence. And um, so the the censorship issue is a very interesting one, because if you look at uh, uh, the First Amendment, you know, not all, first of all, not all speech is protected. You cannot yell fire in a crowded theater. You cannot point to someone and say, murder that person. Uh, these are not protected speech, although lying is protected speech, I might, I, I would hasten to add. But the issue here is that um, these are publishers and they're not, they're not the phone company, okay? Uh, they are given a right to decide what's on their site, which makes them publishers, even though they will want to say they're not. But they are publishers. So let's say you were sending an op-ed to a newspaper. Um, th this would, uh, uh, the, the, the newspaper is going to decide whether they want to have that op-ed in their publication or not. And if they don't, guess what? That's not censorship. That's just an editorial decision. And the same thing holds true for social media. It's writ, it's writ large. Uh, I think people are mistaken when they think that uh, when they can't post something on social media that this is censorship. The fact is, only the government can censor you. Uh, and the reason that the, only the government can censor you I should say I should say why censorship is is only can only be done by the government is because let's say uh, you want to get some on social media and it doesn't get on there. Well, that's unfortunate, but it's the same thing as if you sent a short story to a magazine and they said no. Well, that's not censorship; it's editorial choice. Um, you can still uh, if you if you're sending something to a social media and they don't put it on doesn't mean that you can't talk about it. It mean, You can still buy a megaphone and stand on your property or anywhere in town and shout this out. No one can stop you. They can make a noise complaint, but they can't stop you from talking about it. Um, and so my point is that when people say it's censorship, no, what it is, is it's non-amplification. And the non-amplification of your viewpoint is not censorship. Yes. And, you know, and um, from a uh... Uh, definitely, because, you know, from, uh, I guess, a journalist uh, perspective, if you allowed all these things, you know, you'd probably be out of business in seconds. <laughs> Absolutely. They, ha they, are, they are certainly doing some content moderation. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it, it, the important thing to note is that when they, you know, they, they have a lot of people looking at stuff and they, you know, they will try to keep the worst of it off of there. But they don't pretend they can get all of it. And by the way, they don't pretend that they have rules about it. They just, it's kind of case by case. And there's no incentive, really, for them to keep disinformation and violent extremist stuff off the site. It's mainly a PR thing. They, would, they want to be left alone to do what they do. So they make a token, I would call it a token effort to get rid of stuff that would be really offensive, uh, but they're not obligated. To. Right. And I, I think it's also, um, you know, I, I started thinking about a, a, a few things. It's, it reminds me of, um, you know, when companies become, um, I can't think of the word right now, uh, they, too, they become too big. Um, even the, I guess they, the right. government, right? Because most of these people are, you know, billionaires, if not beyond. <laughs> Um, so, yep. so, that's right. uh, you know, it's like, uh, it's, it's like, um, if you were, you know, a five foot two dad and then you now have a six foot four son, is he going to really listen to you when you say you can't go out the door? <laughs> right. Uh, th th there's the, yes, the present law gives them, um, an unprecedented right that no other publisher enjoys. It's total immunity. 
there, there are almost no businesses in, in the world, uh, certainly not in the United States, that have total immunity from, any, from anything. Any company that builds a product that harms people eventually is going to get sued. And if, if under Section 230, that's impossible. And so um, this, is, this is really the reason why we have so much disinformation in social media. It's because it's really part of their business model. And I would really I would want to make sure folks understand that even as they don't have some kind of plan for us or that they're they love disinformation because they, you know, they wanted to disrupt everything. All they really care about is profit. And what they've discovered is that what's what keeps people on uh, their properties longest is hate, discord, anger. Um, and and um, any any kind of uh, negative, you know, emotional stuff, and they've discovered this, and so they promote it. They literally promote disinformation on purpose, not because they like this information, but because they love how people stay on the site so they can sell them more ads. Right, and it reminds me of uh, it's uh, like. Um why the masses are distracted, we run around, we run away with the treasures. <laughs> Looking to reach people who believe what you believe? Advertise on the Project Good podcast. Contact us at projectgood.work slash podcast. Advertise today. And so, you know, I, I guess I had mixed feelings when they had, uh, you know, um, uh, Facebook's uh, Zuckerberg have to stand up and uh, take, um, you know, uh, hear people's complaints and. Uh, oh, when he was in Congress. Yes. And then they wanted uh, apologies. Um, and, and so I don't know. So it's, to me, I have like uh, mixed feelings about that uh, from a, you know, a, a business standpoint. But also, um, like I was saying, like if you're the five foot two dad and you have a six foot four son, does it matter really what you say? You hope they respect you because yeah. you were the the father, right? But if they've grown so big and become so independent, and also you know they can, uh, you know, essentially almost buy you. <laughs> Crack, yes, easily. So then, uh, you know, how do you really? I think you know. I don't mean to sound bleak. But how do we even gain control again? Well, um, that, that's a good point. Uh, however, I, I, I do think I have a solution, um, and I'm not the first one to say it, but we need to get rid of Section 230. Section 230 is why they're six foot four. If, they, if, section, if Section 2 didn't exist, they would just be like every other publisher with a possible downside where their behavior caused major damage. Um, and I'll give you a perfect example of how this works. Uh, so uh, you probably remember the 2015 Paris nightclub attacks in mm -hmm. which a number of people were slaughtered by ISIS um, operatives in Par at a Paris nightclub. Well, uh, uh, they, one of the people there was uh, on record for having been radicalized by YouTube videos created by ISIS to invite them and teach them how to kill people. And they discovered all this on YouTube and YouTube did its usual thing, which is, do you want to see more of that? Because you said you liked it, right? Uh, and, ev and eventually all these people were killed. One of them, at least one of them, was an American, uh, last name of Gonzalez. And so, uh, uh, Gonzalez's family sued Google, which is the owner of YouTube, saying that you, under tort law, United States tort law, have a proximate cause liability to my daughter's death because your platform was used to radicalize the person who shot her. And he got pretty far with his lawsuit. He kept getting appealed. It got appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court kicked it out and said, well, no, Section 230 protects uh, YouTube slash Google against everything. So you have no case. Um, if there was no Section 230, he certainly would have had a case. And here's how I know that. Uh, you'll also remember 
the Fox News uh, settlement with Dominion Voting Systems, where Fox News uh, essentially uh, was accused of lying about the, uh, how the, ele- the 2020 election was stolen. And they were promoting this idea without any evidence whatsoever, but they kept promoting it. And eventually Dominion Voting Systems says, you guys have been lying about us and you have damaged our company. So we're going to sue you. And what happened was Fox News was forced to settle with them for $750 million. The reason they had to settle, they're not protected by Section 230 because they're not a platform. And that's the, that to me is the equation right there. If you take away Section 230, all of a sudden all these social media sites can still do what they do and become fabulously wealthy, but there'll now be a big downside if they promote open, obvious lies, disinformation, and violent threats. Now, I'm 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 understanding um, the removal of Section 230, but here's the thing, and I'm sure you've already thought about this: with the internet, things tend to live forever. So, how do we? Uh, you know, let's say, okay, so let's say 230 gets removed. Um, uh, it's here in the U.S., right? Mm-hmm. Um, but then these companies have a global reach, right? Uh, uh, so different countries have different rules, regulations, you know, what's allowed, what's not ar- allowed. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so it, it, I guess it starts at least here um, that they, um, you know, would have to pay attention but then there's also yes. the fact that um, these things that uh, have been falsehoods or, uh, you know, or horrible things, you know, beheadings and all this craziness that happens these days yep. um, are still out there. So how do we how do we come and like clean that up, really? Well, I, I'm not sure we can clean it all up. But uh, what I will say is this. The United States happens to be one of the countries with the fewest restrictions on internet, uh, partly because of Section 230 and partly because of the First Amendment. It would be, it's interesting to note that if you look at a place like the UK or Germany, where no one's complaining that they don't have freedom of speech, the fact is because they don't, uh, and this is a surprise to a lot of people, they don't have any First Amendment in either one of those places. Uh, And so, uh, and I'm not, and I, I am a First Amendment person. I'm not saying we get rid of the First Amendment, but uh, uh, these other countries where there is freedom of speech and the press can do whatever, can print um, whatever they choose. However, if, in the UK, uh, the government can make Facebook, for instance, take stuff down. And I was talking to um, someone who works for the London Metropolitan Police at a conference, and he said. When we, we're monitoring and when we see, for instance, on Instagram, an invitation to self-harm to a group of youngsters, we get in touch with, face, with, with the owner, well, Facebook owns Instagram, and we say, you have to take that down in the UK. That you, you can't have that here. You can't, no one here can do that in the United States because of the First Amendment. Uh, in, the, in Germany, for instance, they have freedom of speech, but they have uh, a lot of restrictions about violent insults and harassment and, and a lot of things that really would be much di- very very difficult here uh, and not least because there's a constituency uh, for what we call free speech absolutism which is is an absolute misnomer because it's not it it really means free speech for me but not for thee um, but my, I would hasten to point out that other countries have their own ways of doing this, and some of them are ahead of us in terms of what they can keep out of the the, it, the, uh, the the feeds of the people in their country. Yeah, so that leads me then to start thinking about, um, I'll call it the, the, the foundation or the seeds or um, the, I guess I would even go to say the mindset of, uh, Americans, do you think that because we, uh, you know, all the, the all the things that are the shown, um, do you think it's uh, do we have to like uh, have a like a do we have a moral epidemic here in the U.S. Um, that we can't seem to, I guess, stop ourselves? 
<laughs> well, we, we do seem to have a moral epidemic, but I believe it's driven by this this kind of pernicious combination of of uh, being a, of social media companies being extraordinarily powerful communicators and being above the laws that govern all other public communications in the country. And that's what's different about it. And that's why disinformation is, is chiefly uh, 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 disseminated via social media. If you take away that immunity and suddenly a Facebook or an X or what, whoever has a downside, a possible downside to um, really violent and damaging information, I believe their approach and their behavior would change accordingly. But, and what will happen is, is what happens with every other publisher. We don't notice that um, you know reputable organizations that are governed by the FCC and don't have immunity. We don't see them promote just like putting out lie after lie after lie after lie, just because someone wanted them to. Yeah, and I I guess the last question I have on this is is um, I guess who becomes uh, it's uh, it's the question of I guess uh, the. In my mind, have popped up the the word truth regulator. I know it's not a real word, but like who mm-hmm. becomes who becomes like the you know the guidepost because you know obviously with it, when it comes to journalism, um, things that are written or you have to go on the news, there is a process that um, journalists are th- taught. You have to go and you have to research, you have to verify all the facts. But they that might not be a realistic approach um, with social media because. Um, these things that uh, are posted are sometimes instantaneous. Um, they're they're personal uh, human um, uh, interactions. They are. No, this uh, is true. Uh, this is true. So how do we, you know, in in a in a case of um, you know journalism and media, there are steps that somebody needs to follow in order for it yeah. to quote unquote a good story, um, sure. uh, you know, correct. But how right. do we do that in these things that are like sometimes people's personal lives understood well the first thing i want to say is i am not i don't want to try and say that uh, uh, uh journalism has been free of exaggeration or posturing or slanting things and sometimes making things up but in general the the the, the uh the business of journalism and the business of uh of media companies has been we want to be a trusted source that's where they see their money right uh-huh. Uh, the thing about social media is that um, none of those things hold true. That, uh, and when you ask how we would uh, how we would change it, well, they do have content moderation already. They would just have to do a much better job. And and I would hasten to add that I'm not talking about um, uh, reducing the amount of offensiveness per se, because that's not really actionable. If you take away Section 230, everything stays the same except that Gonzalez, whose daughter was murdered by someone who was radicalized on YouTube, would have a case. But a person who was merely offended or felt you know, that they might have been damaged but they really weren't, that case would get thrown out of court very quickly. But the real damaging stuff where people are um, in fact, materially damaged or harmed or killed, those would have currency in the courts. And that's where the, uh, the, the, the platforms would have to wake up and make sure that their platforms were not being used to physically harm people. Yes. Yeah. There's been a, uh, it's sad to say something that, um, you know, uh, started out, I think, as a, uh, a way to connect people has actually disconnected people. <laughs> yeah, well, well, the bad guys got a hold of it. Uh, and, you know, like I was saying before, there was a long period when the bad guys hadn't figured out how to do it, but now they have. And so uh, now we have uh, bad guys, but we have robbers, but no cops in a way. Um, and, and by the way, what I, wanna, what I really want to make clear is that if you get rid of Section 230 and you and you um, essentially devolve them into a condition of the same liability that every other publisher has, the government doesn't do anything. 
There are no, there's no censorship. There's no talking from the administration to the big platforms. Can you please take this stuff off? The only thing that changes is that they can be sued in court, exactly like Fox News was sued. And guess who's not talking about a stolen election anymore? <laughs> this is true. Um, I want to switch the conversation over to uh, your new book and also talk yeah. about, um, you know, uh, obviously you, you have your your uh, your first book was, um, you know, digital was destroying everything. And now you have a another book, uh, Army of Lo- uh, Liars. Um, and so I guess the other thing is because you work in uh, the digital uh, world, um, my first question is uh, why write these books and. Um, you would think, you know, since you are working in that world, you would be like, rah, rah, let's move for more and more and more and be like, right. you know, forget what you've been told. Digital is wonderful. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, this, so it, it surprises me. <laughs> yes. Um, I think it surprised a lot of people, including uh, my publisher, when when they asked me to submit a proposal for my first book. I don't think they were expecting a title called Digital is Destroying Everything. But they did. They did publish it. Um And um, so here's the thing. I feel like there's, I have always felt that there's been a larger picture than what uh, the the so-called tech bros would want us to think about. And I I felt this for a very, very long time, that digital had its good points and its bad points, just like everything else. And unfortunately, what I felt back when I wrote the first book was that nobody was talking about any possible downsides. Now, it's important to note that at this time, uh, say 20, when I was writing the book, 2014, it got published in 2015. This was a time of general optimism. Um, You know, we were in the Obama administration. A lot of people were saying we were post-racial, not me. Some people were. Uh, I think there was a sort of air of complacency, if I may say so, about a lot of things in American life. Uh, and um, I was noticing that um, one of the things that, you know, co- some of the things that were happening in digital were not pleasant. Uh, you know, we were already starting to see the loss of some types of jobs. We were already seeing, um, uh, you know, algorithms determining what we would see in our news and our feeds. And the, this is a form of manipulation, uh, not all terrible, because um, this, there's nothing like seeing stuff that you're interested in online, but that has its limits. And so I was pointing these things out, um, and um, you know, uh, and a lot of them ended up coming, all the things I predicted ended up coming true, like nations hacking at nations, and the and the and the way that. Um, uh, we would lose civil discourse with, with so with the, the advent of social media, and so um, uh, when I decided I wanted to write my second book, which was really all about Section Two Thirty disin and and specifically disinformation in social media, often fueled by artificial intelligence, uh, I went back to the publisher, and they were like, "Wow, this is uh, some crazy stuff here," but. Because your last book uh, uh, accurately predicted a fair amount of things, we're going to publish this one as well. And so uh, that's how I that's kind of how the second one came out. Yes. And, you know, you brought up something that I, I, I didn't think about and Well, I guess I've thought about it, but never really leaned into it, that um, you kind of mark the period where this started to get um, out of hand. So during the Obama time. I think because people, um, I, I would say, especially um, here in the U.S. and then it, it spread globally, um, the U.S. quote unquote um, had the feeling or had the image that um, it had come overcome its quote unquote biggest challenge of yes. uh, uh, racism, and so people were like, "Oh, finally, finally!" You know, it, it happened, and so now all the things that we used to think that we had to be. I'll call it buttoned up about. Yep. Um, and now we could, uh, you know, we didn't have to wear our ties anymore. People were just like, you know, let my chest hair stand out if I want to. <laughs> yep. 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 And 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 so um, that I actually 
you know, I, I didn't, um, uh, obviously, I know a lot of things went on. Everybody knows a lot went on in the Obama administration, but um, I didn't think of it as that is the the turning point of when people felt that they could loosen up yeah. because, the, because they felt that we, um, you know, we got over our biggest problems. So what other other things were just they're not as important anymore. Right, right. The rest was going to all be all gravy. But uh, I think what, you know, uh, what we uh, uh, very sadly discovered was that um, uh, the racists and, and, uh, and other forms of haters needed a permission structure in order to come out. And it was during this period of relative complacency where um, I believe that this you know, that started to take off and nobody was really noticing it that much uh, back then. And of course, we know what happened, uh, through, you know, long about 2016, when we really started to see um, lying become a sort of uh, way of life in the United States. And it's very important to note that back in those days, back in, in the 2016 era, uh, there was a candidate who had a Twitter account. And so rather than a journalistic filter on him, which remember that, you know, prior to the internet, there was no way for this, for this person to talk to people directly. They would have had to been interviewed. And, and a lot of the stuff that they said probably would have been fact checked by the, by the journalists, but social media meant they didn't need that anymore. They could just post directly. And they would post directly many, many untruths, uh, dishonest things, and outright lies. And this was this was because of social media. Yes, and so um, you know, you you hit on a couple points that um, uh, sort of I also talked about in the introduction that um, that it's really for people. It's not about really. Um, I guess I can say this, that it's the, the facts sort of don't matter to people when their feelings are involved. Right. And um, and so, you know, um, uh, well, I don't even have to say I hate to say it, but I guess that's, you know, everything is a, an emotional um, uh, trigger. And it's a, a for for people these days. And um, when you talk about, uh, you know, during the time where we loosened up um, during the uh, Obama administration then we end up, you know, um, being introduced to, um, I'll just say, a, a, a seductress, <laughs> of yep. like, or as, a, or as one comedian um, uh, that we uh, know, um, uh, Dave Chappelle has uh, said, you know, an honest liar, um, and yeah. um, you know, um, uh, then we end up in a a lockdown like prisoners <laughs> yep, <laughs> and, yeah. and, we all, and we know that you know um when you are in prison the worst thing that can happen to you is to go into isolation um so it just it, it is like uh it's almost like um um you know a, a perfect recipe for disaster yeah and so, so and and dur yeah, during lockdown so many things moved online uh so very quickly including i might add telemedicine which until then was almost like a dead letter. Like you could, you know, you'd have to go see the doctor. And then all of a sudden it was like, no, you can actually just talk to them, which, which makes sense. But there's so many, there's so many other things that, that pe people, their entire lives went online. And so, uh, and I think we're, we're, and I think they still are for a lot of people. Like a lot of people are just, not interacting with people in real time, especially younger people who don't remember what it was like before there was uh, uh, social media. And uh, they kind of grew up in an area where some critical years of their lives were spent like not being able to see anybody. And so it's no surprise that, um, you know, a generation is online almost constantly. Now, do you think that, um, you know, this is a question that is like, uh, I'll, I'll call this the the beauty pageant question. Um, cause it's like, uh, you know, it, it's always so hard to, to, uh, to answer, but do you think, uh, why do you think, or do you think, I guess, hate has risen so much? Is it really the social media or is it now, um, you know, this, this mix of this, uh, you know, um, cause I just uh, explained like what the perfect, uh, you know, recipe was, 
Whereas yeah. now the mix that we now have this AI thing that's getting thrown in, or is it just yeah. like we've, we found weapons and we know how to use them, but the hate was always like, you know, at this extreme level. Um, I don't think it was always at this extreme level. I think it did exist. And there's, a, there's been a core of haters uh, uh, throughout. Okay. And those people felt very uncomfortable speaking out because they, they would have been condemned. Uh, uh, or, or, or they would have would have had no way to get their message directly out because unless they were going to figure out a way to contact everyone without social media, uh, they wouldn't have been able to. Uh, but what what has happened is that social media enabled those dedicated haters, if I can call them that, and I and they do exist, um, suddenly had a way without spending a nickel to reach everyone in the world. And so what they did was they found a lot of fellow travelers, people who were angry about this or that. And, they're, and maybe they're not even necessarily racists or whatever, but somehow this message of dissatisfaction and the government is lying and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It all builds up into a constituency, which um, then is leveraged by extremists as, you know, it, it, into the kind of situation we have today. Now, uh, I this is maybe a funny question, and I'm 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 just going to ask it, even though it may sound weird. Do you think that the the U.S. is um, uh, maybe an over emotional uh, crybabies of people that need that need um, you know I guess to uh, to be regulated in some way. <laughs> Well, all I can say is uh, that um, I believe that um, a lot of people who uh, uh, comprise a certain voting block have been manipulated by disinformation. And uh, I, I feel like this is really kind of the crux of the problem that uh, you know, a lot of most people may not have felt very strongly about one thing or another until they are bombarded with constant messages that are essentially lies about other groups of people. Um, you know, for instance, that every, uh, every gay person is grooming people for sex. Um, you know, these kind of insidious lies that just get promoted over and over again. Eventually, there are people who are like, huh, you know, I've seen that like 25 times. It must... I'm thinking it must be true by now. What they don't realize is that they're in an echo chamber created by the social media company for the social media company so that they can sell ads. And then, you know, the message that gets targeted at that person, plus the ads that the, the social media gets paid to show them, it all ends up into a big ball of confusion. Yeah. And it just, it, it, it it's, it, um, uh, not to use, but I'm going to use the the term. It just becomes a big uh, 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 to be, uh, um, uh, meaning and not meaning. It just becomes a big web. <laughs> yes, right. It's it's a that's true. It, it is a it is a uh, it is rather a web um, of of, uh, of a certain type of constituent, a persuadable type of constituent, a person who doesn't uh, you know doesn't fact check on their own. Uh, who, do, who doesn't probably read very widely, and they, they're easy to manipulate uh, once you've figured out what audience they are. And, and these, um, what, again, I'm going to go use the word cynical manipulators. They will use these platforms to target people and deliver messaging to them that um, <clears throat> ends up driving um, uh, electoral results. So what needs to change in the future regarding how people interact and consume information um, you know, in these times, because, OK, let's, um, you know, I don't think unless uh, amazing things happen, but we know how long it takes um, for uh, major changes to happen in the country. Like, I don't know, if, you know, tomorrow they would just say, OK, that's enough. We throw out Section 230. It'll probably take, you know, a, a very long time. And then you have to fight, you know, maybe billionaires or trillionaires at this point. Um, you know, to 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 get past that. So, how can um, individuals, I guess, start making the the change in order to have that ripple effect? Because I believe that 
um, we're in a time where people have to become their own um, advocate. They have yeah. to um, start, um, you know, you you got to you have to decide to be your own independent thinker because we're getting in times where the the technology and you may not soon know how to def- uh, be uh, different from each other. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so, so it is a burden that has that has devolved to the individual. Um, we used to have fact checkers. Uh, uh, th- th- these were, you know, journalists at uh, uh, media companies, and we fired them all because we stopped reading newspapers and magazines, and we're getting all of our information online. And so, these other publishers have gone almost all local newspapers now are either, you know, uh, nothing but a, you know, uh, a reason for the supermarket to put us uh, an ad in there, uh, uh, you know, a sheaf of coupons in there, or they're out of business entirely. And so uh, the only source for a lot of people are, is online. And what, uh, what the, what the uh, uh, media, uh, the social media companies have done is essentially they're saying, well, you can have all the news except for one piece, the fact checking. That's going to be up to you because we're not doing any. And so it devolves onto the individual and they can go to Snopes.com and look at what Snopes says about any a particular story, which may or, not, may or may not be the one you're interested in. Or you'll see the PolitiFact truthometer, which um, is often seen, you know, determining whether something was a lie or not. And there's other tools out there, but um, largely it becomes a matter of self-improvement and self-education. And uh, so, you know, if somebody sees um, something that seems incendiary or uh, has no corroboration in any other form, uh, th- these are these are things that people can do to protect themselves. But I I really feel like this is kind of a teacup against the tidal wave, and so. The deprecation of Section 230, I believe, is going to be hugely important. I, I would really want to make sure uh, I point out that there is a bill in Congress to get rid of it, it's sponsored by Congressman Pallone from New Jersey, who's also a Republican from the state of Washington involved in it. And it's just, it's a very simple bill, the Sunset Section 230. Uh, I don't, it's, it's probably not going anywhere much right now, but it is there. And folks can uh, write to their Congress people and say, you know, we 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 need we need this because we need we need these uh, these companies to be at least as responsible as every other publisher. Yes. And then um, last question, kind of on the regulation and, and uh, kind of legal ease side. Um, do you think like uh, globally there should be rules for social media? Well, there may it, it may I may think so, but I think that's a bridge too far. I don't think the world is ever going to come up with some anything like that. But it's important to note that you know um, countries do do control what happens inside of of their nation. Uh, so uh, depending, you know, and and you know if you're if you're in the United States or or a country in the EU or South Korea or Japan. Um, those are discrete areas where things are either on or not on. It's not, it's not that there's just one global um, platform, if you will. It's actually uh, uh, they have to have to comply with laws in different countries. And then here's another um, beauty pageant question before I give you the last question. Um, yeah, this is, uh, <laughs> I think, has been asked since uh, maybe the beginning of the time. Um, what would you say is truth? Well, I, I, you know, when I do my speaking engagements, I always, the first thing I tell people is that I may be talking to you about truth and facts, but I don't have any special relationship with truth. And I'm not sure I even know what the word truth means, but I will say that I know that facts matter, that, uh, uh, you know, facts are things that are incontrovertible. For instance, um, a fact is the Titanic sank. Uh, what the truth is about that might be more complicated, but in the end, that did happen. We know it happened, and, and that's what I kind of rely on. So the facts, which goes back to, uh, I guess we wish we had our journalists. <laughs> right, 
Yes. We, yes, we fought, but we got rid of them all. <laughs> yes. Um, and my my last question, this is um, uh, because since you are uh, a lover of uh, technology and digital, um, I guess, what do you see as the next frontier that we're going to be facing in, um, I guess, this digital information age? Mm-hmm. It's going to be artificial intelligence, I believe. Uh, I think what we're going to see is uh, and we're going to be inundated with uh, content created by artificial intelligence without hardly any human interaction. Uh, I'm finding that I'm noticing a lot of articles seem awfully generalized these days. And uh, I, I, I feel pretty strongly that a lot of companies are resorting to this for you know the who, what, why, when, where they don't really do any analysis. They just, you know, it's just telling you stuff. And um, so, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, with AI is going to impact um, things like medicine. Um, a- any sort of science is going to be uh, vastly improved by AI, but it's going to come with a cost. A lot of people are going to end up not having jobs because AI is doing the work. So we may have to address that um, in uh, coming down the road. Yeah, with the, with that, even um, I guess uh, I don't mean to also be bleak, but it's uh, to me obvious. Um, and I think you know it's the thing that everybody's scared of is because we are uh, not only you know I'm not that you know people don't love working, <laughs> mm-hmm. but um, I know so people would be like, okay, well, yay, you know, our lives may be easier, but on that um, you know uh, easy spectrum, we are thinking and social beings so then that could free us up to um you know we hope good things but maybe not as people because people are not working and um even though people always say they don't you know want to maybe uh, be working here or there and trying to just think of their retirement uh, um, yeah. but i think it's uh people people sometimes don't understand the importance of work it's not just about you know the money Right. Uh, and, and certainly the, what seems to be impacted, first of all, are the creative fields, uh, which uh, some, some, a friend of mine said, you know, we always thought that, you know, uh, you know, robots would be doing all the hard work and we get to do all the cool stuff. And it turns out that robots are now doing all the fun work and, and we're, we're getting stuck digging the ditches. Uh, so that, that's not good. But um, I feel like People always seem to figure out a way to uh, have outlets for their creativity, and there may need to be different ways now, uh, but um, certainly uh, artificial intelligence is, it se- seems to be, at least in the commercial fields, um, really kind of taking a very prominent position. Yes, I'm, I'm interested to see how we, go- how we are going to uh, turn out, so I guess I will... Uh, buckle my seat belt um, because I'm sure yep. the ride is going to get exciting just starting probably yeah. in a few months. <laughs> yeah, you live in exciting times, they say. <laughs> yes. So thank you, Andrew, for your time and insight. If you'd like to learn more about Andrew V. Edwards and his new book, Army of Liars, go to andrewedwards.com. If you have a passion for an underserved community, a social justice problem, or simply want to change minds, contact Project Good Work at projectgood.org to start your project of change today. For our listeners, thanks for tuning in to Project Good, where we're focused on what matters. 